Okay, hello and welcome to some new slides. These are on graph theory and graphs. They are very similar to trees, which you already know about, but they are more general and it is wonderful. We've actually seen a directed graph already, right? When we talked about relations, we'll, we'll go even further this time though. And my motivational example is something that I saw on Instagram a couple years ago. Maybe you saw this too, but there was like a book exchange message going around where some of my friends have, had been sending this like copied and pasted message to a bunch of people like on their story. And it was absolutely a pyramid scheme and we can prove it with graph theory. So if you'd like to read this, maybe you've seen it already. That's like, you have to buy, you can buy one book and send it to one person and somehow you're gonna end up with 36 books on your own. And uh, that is problematic. And I can prove to you why because we can use graphs. We can use directed graphs to talk about who's getting books and who's not, okay? So the idea was these book exchanges, this little, this pyramid scheme involved somebody, somebody making a post and then somebody responding to it. And you saw this person's post. This is the poster. And they learned about this post from the person before them. And then you, you come along, you see your friend's post and you're like, I want to, I want to be part of this book exchange. So I'm going to message them and they're going to say, all right, the one person you need to send a book to is this one, the person who came before them. Okay. And that's the idea. And eventually they're asking you to send off a bunch of messages and like you post on your story and you get a bunch of recruits who also are going to want their 36 books and they'll, they'll buy one and you tell them to send a book, their favorite book to this person who came before you. So you kind of see how the game is being played. All these people, uh, the next people come to the person before you. That's, that's what's happening there. And so yeah, some of your friends respond, some don't. And then this person gets a lot of messages and then hopefully these people play the game and give you stuff too. Okay, so that's that's the pyramid scheme. It's just like everybody's linked to the posters two before them. And the problem with this scheme is that it's a pyramid scheme and you're going to end up with people way over here who are like, I want to participate. I want to participate in like the they say that to the people before them and they give them a book and then they post it. But all of their friends have already taken part in this pyramid scheme. There's nobody left. There's nobody left to give them a book. And so all these things that they wish they had, they wish they had all these incoming arrows, these connections and graphs, they're not going to get any. And so that is, uh, that's why it's a pyramid scheme. It can't go on forever. There's got to be a last person and uh, you've saturated the market at that point. So yeah, this idea of dots and arrows, that's graphs. That's all it is. And let's keep on going with that. Uh, when, when there are arrows, it's called a directed graph, by the way. Okay, so that's important. Let's talk about graphs in general, uh, namely undirected graphs. So that's the new one. All right. So when you have an undirected graph, there are, there are places that you can go, but there are no arrows between them. Like you can't have something like this. Doesn't work out. You can't go in one direction. You have essentially a line, which represents the fact that you could go in either direction. It's called an undirected graph. Okay. So, that's all. That's the that's the only difference. You can you could move in either direction, so we don't draw arrows anymore. That's what an undirected graph is all about. And yeah, uh, here here's what an undirected graph means. How, what do you need to d to describe one? You need two things. You need a set of vertices, which are your dots, your places to go. And so here are your vertices, V. In this graph, it's going to be A, B, C, D, and E. Those are the places that you can go. Those are called vertices. A, B. C, D, and E. And so that's one set. And then you have a set of edges, which says, all right, what are the links between the vertices? Which ones exist? Like some don't, right? This one doesn't exist, but others do like this one's here. So there's a way to get in between those places. And so uh, edges in an undirected graph, there is no ordering. There's like, uh, like this edge would have been something like if this was X and Y, and this was also X and Y, this edge would have been represented by an ordered pair, right? The arrows going from X to Y. But when you have an undirected graph, there is no, no ordering. And so every edge is essentially just a set. 
an edge is a set of the two things that are connected. All right? So with that in mind, the set of edges for an undirected graph is a set of sets. It's like, all right, it's made up of all of these different edges. There's one from A to B. So here's one of the edges. It's just a set saying that A and B are connected. There's no order to them because you can go either way. You see that? So that's important. And then there's one from B to C. And I think you get the idea. And you can write the rest yourself. Right? So there's a B to C set, dot, dot, dot. And that is all the edges that you see. Like there's a, there's a B, E, an A, C, E, D, C, D. All those exist. OK, so those are edges and vertices. You can also have what's called a weighted graph, which is useful when you're like making maps and things. So uh, when you have weights, they're associated with edges. And it, it kind of means it costs this much from, to go between A and B. Like it's five miles away, or it costs $5 on the toll road, or something like that. That is what weighted graphs are all about. There's a, there's a cost to, there's a weight to following an edge. So like this could be 42, this can be, I don't know, 12, 8 to get from E to D and vice versa and backwards, and 5 from C to D. You can also have negative edges. That's OK. Uh, like this can be negative 17. Like uh, you win money when you go from B to C or something, or from C to B. So that's a weighted graph. Uh, yeah, those are just some terms. Hopefully they will make enough sense with enough examples. So. Here are some interesting ideas. Like this looks normal. This graph looks normal, even if I add weights. This graph looks weird. So let's talk about what those are and why it, why we think they're weird. Okay. So first of all, it's odd to have multiple edges in between places. Those are called parallel edges. Those these are two separate edges from A to B, and apparently they mean different things. Maybe one's like a toll road with slightly shorter distance, but it costs five bucks to get there and to use the road. But this one's free. It's just the, the normal highway. But it's longer. Something like that. That's, that's what parallel edges mean. There's, there's, you have a choice. Like Either one of these can be followed, but maybe there's a weight involved that's going to differentiate the two. There's also a concept of self loops in undirected graphs, but these look weird. They're just little rings. There's no arrows anymore, right? Because you can follow it in any direction. So self loops aren't very common in a undirected graph. But that's just an edge between a vertex and itself odd. And then uh, normally we care about simple graphs. Those are the non weird ones. Every simple graph we say, like this one is called a simple graph. Every simple graph is one that does not have parallel edges and it also does not have self loops. So this, this is a complex graph. This is a non simple graph. But the one on the previous slide was simple. Okay, usually we care about the simple ones. And so we give them a name. All right, let's talk about normal simple graph uh, terminology. All right, so if I have an edge, like this edge, it exists between A and B. If, if, the, if it's there, if there is an edge, I say that A and B are adjacent. There's a way to go right between them. OK, there is an edge. So if there is an edge, we say that those two vertices are adjacent. So A and B are connected by an edge. So that means they are adjacent. A and B are adjacent. All right, they're like touching each other in a sense. Uh, let's see, B and C are also adjacent. B and C are adjacent. I'll just use quotes for that because uh, there's an edge between them. Uh, let's see here. A and D, there's no way to get straight from there to there, so A and D are not adjacent. Same with A and E. OK, so that's that. Just means who's next to you in terms of edges. Um, let's see. You can also talk about it from one of the edge, from one of the vertices' perspectives. It's like you can say that there's a neighbor. So if C is a neighbor of B, if and only if they're connected. If there's an edge between the two. So like this edge means that C has B as a neighbor and B has C as a neighbor. That's all. Again, concept of adjacency all over again. Uh, there's also a question of degree. In a simple graph, the degree of a vertex, we say, is the number of neighbors it has. So for example, this uh, vertex B, it has degree 3. Do you see why? It has three neighbors. It has A as a neighbor, C as a neighbor. Uh, maybe I should draw this slightly cleaner. It has A as a neighbor, it has C as a neighbor, and it has E as a neighbor. That's why it has degree 3. And you can also talk about the degree of the entire graph. The 
the total degree of a graph, like of the whole thing, is just the sum of the degrees of all of its vertices. So that means the degree of this example graph, degree of the whole graph, and that kind of tells you how connected it all is. That is equal to two, because that has A has two neighbors, plus the three neighbors that we know B has, plus the three neighbors that C has, it's got three, right? And then D has two neighbors, C and E. And then E has two neighbors, B and D. So that's what, six plus six is 12. So that's the degree of the entire graph. Uh, let's see what else, what else? Um, you can pick out pieces of a graph that you like. You can take just a few vertices and just a few edges out of out of a graph, and that's called a subgraph. So you can make a subgraph from an original graph when you make like the subgraph's vertices are a subset of the original vertices. The subgraph's edges are a subset of the original graph's edges. So you can you can pick and choose. All right. You can pick and choose just which vertices and edges you want. Uh, first of all, because it's subset or equal to relationship, every graph is a subgraph of itself, first of all. And then also just the idea is a subgraph of a graph is just take the original graph and throw some vertices or edges away. That's all it is, okay? You can also think about it as picking out certain edges. So for example, let's say that, I don't know, I wanna make the graph that looks like this. I want to take just this piece of this original graph. So I want to throw away this edge and throw away this edge and also throw away this vertex. Okay? So this is going to be a subgraph of the original graph. It looks like this. So this will be a subgraph. It has some of the vertices, a subset of the vertices. It only is using B, A, C, and D. And it has a subset of the edges. It's only using this one, this one, and this one. You see that? So that is a subgraph of the original graph. It's just a piece of it. That's all. So that's that one. And yeah, that's that's some terminology in a nutshell. And graphs are great for this idea of like what's next to other things. So maps are very common. Like Google Maps has a graph of like which roads are adjacent to each other. And that's how it tells you the quickest way to get places and gives you options and stuff like that. So here is a graph representation of uh, an undirected graph representation of the world, I guess, which countries are adjacent to each other. Looks like, looks like Germany has a lot of countries next to it. Russia does too, etc., etc. So that's a silly example, I guess. All right, let's keep on going. Uh, no, to here, yes. So let's talk about some cool looking simple graphs, some fancy ones, I guess. So let's make some new terms here. As usual with every new concept, there are new terms. Uh, if you have a regular graph, that means that every vertex has the same degree. It has all this, it has the same number of neighbors. And so this graph, for example, right here is called a regular graph because, or a three regular graph, because every vertex has three edges coming out of it, three neighbors. So like this edge, if you zoom in on it, it has three neighbors. One, two, three, every single edge. This one has three neighbors. One, two, three. This one has three neighbors. They all do. One, two, three, this one, one, two, three. There's so many to choose from, but each one has the same degree, and so that's special. We call that a regular graph, and you can even like prepend the, uh, the number of the degree of each edge. So that's a, that's a regular graph. Next we have a, uh, a graph that we lovingly refer to as K with a subscript of a number. So K sub N or KN, we call the complete graph on N vertices. So this is K6, for example, because it has six vertices. And we say that it's complete in that every vertex has a link to everyone else. It's like everybody is your neighbor. You, you live right next to everybody here. So every single node in this graph has a link to everybody else. There's only one graph with six, with six nodes, with six vertices that has this property. Everybody else uh, looks like this, right? Everybody's linked to everybody else. There's only one graph like that for every 
uh, number of nodes. So that's called a complete graph, K for complete, I guess. Uh, complete graph on N vertices. It's also sometimes called a clique. It's pronounced clique, this word. We use the French pronunciation, though, like in English, when you're talking about like a clique of people, we say it like that. But in math, we call this a clique as well of size N or an, uh, like a size six clique or a six clique. And, uh, but I think K6 is shorter. And so it just means that every possible edge that could be there exists to keep it simple at least though. There's no like self loops or weird parallel edges or something like that. This is K6, right? And then finally we have KNM. That's probably the weirdest one of the three. This is what it looks like. So K6, it has every edge to everybody else. K34, for example, is like there's a, there's a, like a, a partition. There's, there's a, we've chopped up our graph into two halves, essentially. We have uh, three on the left and four on the right, essentially. So let me let me at least read these bullets first. So K and M is weird. Here are the rules. It has N plus M vertices. So like K34 is going to have three plus four vertices. And then we're dividing those nodes, those vertices, into two different sets. One with the N number and one with the M. So here we have three on the left and four on the right, essentially. That's what's going on there. And then we do not allow everybody in this set over here to have any links among themselves, like none of those exist. So none of these can talk to e each other directly, but they have a way of getting to everybody on the other side. That's the idea, all right? So there is an edge between every vertex in one set and every vertex in the other set. That is uh, what makes K and M special. And so everybody over here can't talk to each other, but they can talk to everybody over here and vice versa. Like each one of these nodes has a way of getting to every one of these nodes on the other side. That is K34. Hopefully the drawing makes, makes more sense than my explanation. It's, it's a weird explanation, but that's what I mean when I say K34. I think uh, you can imagine what K45 would look like or K55. Just make two sets. They can't talk to each other, but they can go to everybody on the other side. Okay, so that's that one. Uh, with that in mind, maybe take a second to, to look at this because I, I have a question for you about uh, this idea. So how many edges, first of all, are in K34? And is K34 a regular graph? So here it is again, K34. Here's the rules for it. And let me go up to the definition of regularity as well. Was it here? Oh gosh, where did I put it? Weighted graph, simple. Oh, sorry, it was on the same page, excuse me. So here's regular graph, regular graph, and then K34. What do you think? All right, and also, did you notice a pattern? So K34 is, you make a set of three over here, a set of four over here, And here are the edges that exist. This is K34. I guess I could have just copied the picture, but it's good to, to spell out what's going on here. So everybody over here can talk to each other. But they have a link to everyone in the other set. One, two, three, four. And then this one can talk to all of these. One, two, three, four. And then this one finally can do the same one two, three. Okay, so that's K3, four. And how many edges are there? Well, I guess you can think about it as you can kind of from these or from these, it's like, all right, this one's going to four people, this one's going to four people, this one's going to four people. So that's, that's why it's 12. Or this one's going to three people. This one's going to three, this one's going to three, this one's going to three, etc., etc. Oh, did I skip this one? Whee, that looked weird, no wonder. So either way, it's 12, right? It's three times four. That's the pattern. Three times four equals 12 edges. And then also it is, uh, is it regular? Like do every vertex, does every vertex have the same degree? These guys have degree four, but all these guys have degree three. So it is not regular. It would have been regular if it was like K three, three maybe, but no, the numbers are different. Okay, let's talk about, because I mean, the goal of all this is like, we want to make maps and we want to make uh, uh, a program that tells me how to get to 
uh, how to get to school the fastest or something. We want to be able to represent graphs inside of our computer, so let's figure out the common ways of doing this. All right, so here are the two competing ways, the main ways of representing a graph inside of a computer. All right, they're very common. They're things that we want to have. So here is how you can do it. So there's two main ways. Probably the most used way is called an adjacency list representation. So here's the graph. Let's pretend this is the graph that we want to represent inside of a computer. Like uh, it looks like this. It has five vertices, A, B, C, D, and E, and it like has a link between A and B, a link between A and C, etc., etc. All right. So when with an adjacency list, you make a list, uh, or I guess you make a map of strings to lists. That is what an adjacency graph is. And this is a type def, by the way. This is saying that make this type called adjacency graph equivalent to this, so that I don't have to type this every time. And so now I can just say adjacency graph g everywhere. And that's instead of saying this. An adjacency graph is just a map of strings to list of string. And here's how it would be stored. So it's a map, so it's taking every vertex name to a list of all the edges, all the other vertices that it's connected to by an edge. All right, so for example, you have to make all of them. It's a map containing all of them as keys, but the values for each vertex is all the places that this is connected to, all the edges that exist. So if there's an edge between A and B coming out of A, you want to add B to this list. That is one of the edges. That's one of the things that it's adjacent to. That's why it's called an adjacency list. That's keeping track of all the things adjacent to A. So B is adjacent to A, and so is C. C is also adjacent to A. Right? So you can either use a map or, or an unordered map in C++. It's just the keys are the names of your vertices, and the values are all the things in some form. Could be a list, could be, could be a set. Who cares? Some uh, way of talking about all the things that it's adjacent to. So A is adjacent to B and C. B is adjacent to A, C, and E. So you save all of those in the list like that. C is adjacent to A, B, and D. You got to save them in the list. So they're, they're in both places. Like A is adjacent to B, and also B is adjacent to A. You have both of those sides there. And then E is adjacent to B and D. And so that's why you see it like that. Could be in any order, though. Just like if it's here, you know it's adjacent. That's how you can store the graph, though. All right, so that's one way to do it. Another way is uh, called the matrix representation. So you can store a graph with a matrix, assuming like you have not really given names to your vertices, you've given them numbers, okay? So what a matrix representation of a graph is, is it's an n by n matrix, where you align all the numbers to each other, like these are the rows, these are the columns, and you put a one if this row is adjacent to this column in the graph, like is, two adjacent to one? Yes, it is. There's an edge, so you put a one. If it's not, if there's, uh, like, I guess, is one adjacent to four, for example? Sorry. Is, yeah, is one adjacent to four? Is four adjacent to one? The answer is no. There's no edge that's going straight there, and so you put a zero in that one, right? But every time there is an edge, like from three to four, three to four, for example, or from four to three, either way works, you put a one, okay? So the blue edge, for example, is a, the blue ones. That's what it makes up. Okay, so it's an n by n matrix. All the entries, all of the entries are either zero or one. A zero if that edge is there. A one if it's not there. Okay, so that's an adjacency matrix representation of a graph, and it's essentially it's a two D array. It's a vector of vectors, for example. All right. Uh, the reason most people prefer adjacency lists when they're making a program and storing a graph is because you can think of like this, it's going to take up space. It's a, just a bunch of bools. It's taking up space even if there's like only one edge. Like if these all these edges didn't exist except for this one, there would be like two ones in the matrix and everything else would be a zero. That's that's pretty uncompressed, right? That's that's pretty bad. So that wastes space for when you don't have a lot of edges. And graphs without a lot of edges are called sparse graphs. OK, so 
So usually you'd prefer an adjacency list, but sometimes a matrix is the way to go. So that's why we learned about both. So sparse graph means that there's not many edges. So this is exactly how you would represent these graphs in a computer, though. All right, so with that in mind, here's a graph. Let's call it G. And I'd like you to give me the adjacency list. So write down the adjacency list representation of this graph and also write down the matrix representation of this graph. All right, and here are those examples all over again. So give this a try, and then I'll show you my way. All right, so adjacency list is essentially a map of all of the names of the vertices to a list of all the things that they're adjacent to. So there's going to be five things, five keys in this map because you have A, B, C, D, and E, and each of those will map to a list of all the things that that particular vertex is adjacent to. A, for example, is adjacent to B and C. And so in a list, I will have B and C in some order, indicating that A is adjacent to them. B is adjacent to uh, A and C. Go here or to here. So that's why that's like that. And then C is adjacent to four things. Wow, it's adjacent to B, A, E, and D. So they would all be here, indicating that. D is adjacent to C and E. and E is adjacent to C and D. And so that's the adjacency list representation. You're only saving the things that are actually there. That's the idea. And then the matrix representation is, well, first of all, you have to give like a number to every vertex. Like instead of A, like it's it's row one or something, it's column one. Uh, but let's just pretend we, we did that. We assigned numbers. And so like A is first, A, B, C, D, and E. Those are the names of the rows, I guess are the columns C, D, and E. Same with this for the rows. And then there's a zero if they're there, if like A is adjacent to A, which it's not, there's no self loop, and a one if it's there. So I guess, let's just put all the ones and zeros everywhere else. So there's there's gonna be a node, there's gonna be an edge between A and B. A is connected to B. So we're gonna put a one there. And then you also do the mirror edge because B is also connected to A for the same reason, right? B and A are connected. And so there's also going to be a one here. And so for every edge, there's going to be two ones added. Uh, a is adjacent to C, so A and C is a one, and also C and A is a one. Uh, B and C are connected. So B and C, C and B connected. So that's those first three up there. And then E and C, this one. So that's E and C is a one, and C and E is a one. All right, E and D. So E and D is a one, and then also D and E is a one, and then finally C and D. So C and D is a one, and D and C is a one. I believe that is everything. There should be two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve ones. Does that look like twelve, one, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve? Yeah, I think so. And so zero is everywhere else. Like A is not adjacent to D, A is not adjacent to E, B is not adjacent to B, B is not adjacent to D. All those ideas. So it's a zero everywhere where there's not an edge. Those two nodes are not linked. Okay, so that's the matrix representation of the same graph. So either way, either way works. Uh, some representations are easier to do something, easier to do things than other representations. You'll always pick the best for your uh, for your purposes. Okay, let's let's keep going. I'm sorry, I have so many terms that you just can't escape them. Sadly, this one is called a walk. So you want to be able to move around your graphs. And so now we're, we're using words to describe how you can move around your graphs. Okay, so a walk from some starting vertex, vertex zero to vertex K in an undirected graph is a sequence where like you're saying, well, first of all, it's gonna start at vertex zero and it's supposed to end at vertex K. And it's like, it's like an array of things. It's like a vector of like where you came from. So this is like a big ordered pair, I guess, but your book likes to use these angle brackets, so we are too. So just think of it as like a big long list of things where the order matters. To move a walk, to walk from V0 to VK, it's saying, all right, first I'm going here, then I'm following this edge, which takes me to V1. Then I'm following this edge, which takes me to V2. 
then I'm following this edge, it takes me to some other v vertex, then I'm following this edge to get me to here, and then finally I'm following this edge from that vertex to get me to the VK, vertex K that I was talking about, okay? So that's telling you exactly how you moved around in a graph. You need to specify that. Uh, if the graph is simple and there aren't like multiple ways to get from V0 to V1, then you don't really have to write the edges anymore, but that's what it means to have a walk. Like you are, you're telling me exactly how you moved around this graph. Like I went from A to B to C, and that's a walk where, uh, let me just write this down. So for example, this walk right here, wee. That is one example of a walk, and that is uh, where I start at A, and I use the edge A, B, and then I, now I'm at B, and then I go to C as well, so I'm following the edge B, C, and now I'm ending up at C, and so that's describing exactly how I move from here to here. You see that? So that's a walk, and yeah, so that's one of the terms. That's the most generic term, I guess. Uh, you don't need, this is a simple graph, so technically there's no need to write these edges. It was obvious that there's only one way to get from A to B and one way to get from B to C. Uh, the length of the walk is the number of edges you, f you followed. For example, this walk follows two edges, so its length is two. In this example, like it's, you're following K edges, going from V0 to VK. Okay, a closed walk is a walk where your first and last vertices are the same. So here is a closed walk from A to B, B to C, C back to A. You've closed it off. That's a closed walk. An open walk is where they're different. So this one was an open walk, just A, B, and B to C. That's what, Those are the differences. A circuit is a closed walk where you don't reuse edges. So for example, this was a circuit as well. A, B, B, C, C, A, that was a closed walk and a circuit, but a closed walk is more general. A closed walk could have been A, B, B, C, C, A, and let's do it all over again. A, B, B, C, C, A. So I reuse those edges. That's a closed walk, but it's not a circuit because I followed edges more than once. See the difference? So it's, it's a bit technical. Definitely read over this in your book as well, and it should make sense. But that's the difference between a circuit and a closed walk. Uh, and then finally, a path is when you have a walk and no vertex or edge occurs more than once. So that's kind of, usually we talk about paths mostly in computer science. A path is a walk where no vertex or edge occurs more than once. So boop, 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 this original walk was indeed a path. This is a path from A to C. It's a path from all the way from A to D, for example. But the second you double up and you come back to C, now you've seen a, a vertex twice, no longer a path. Or if you like go back along this edge again, you've reused it, no longer a path. This is a path though. Okay, so that's a path. And then finally, a cycle is essentially almost a path. Like it would have been a path if you didn't come back around on the thing. A cycle is a circuit of length at least one in which no vertex except for the first and last occurs more than once. The first and last vertices are the same. So here is a, uh, a cycle, A to B, B to C, C to, C to A, all over again. Let me see if I can come up with a circuit that is not uh, a cycle. No edge occurs more than once. I think you'd have to get into parallel edges. This is, uh, that would get a little weird, like AC back to CA following those two parallel edges would have been, I believe, a circuit, because you followed edges. You didn't follow each edge twice uh, or something. You just followed two separate edges along the same path. That would have been uh, a circuit, but let's see here. No, I guess it would have been a, a cycle as well. Darn, I'll have to think about this one. Okay, I thought harder. Here is an example of a circuit that is not a cycle. We would, we would need parallel edges. I was right to think about that. So let's pretend we have three sets of parallel edges from A to B, B to C, and C to A, and I could follow any of them. So a circuit, a walk in which no edge occurs more than once, here's a circuit. Follow the blue one, all the blue ones, now you're back at A, but then also follow the black ones, now you're back at A. So it's closed, and we have not duplicated edges, so it is technically a circuit. 
but it's not a cycle because we have duplicated vertices. I came back around A, B, C, back to A, and then I went to B again. You see that along a different parallel edge. That's the difference, okay? Took me a while to think of that. That's, that's a hard one to say the differences there, but I hope that that is clear. Uh, yeah, so that's the idea. Um, I think that is everything that I wanted to talk about on this slide. So yeah, try to keep the, the ideas straight in your head. Go back to the examples that I just gave. I think that would be helpful. Uh, this is one of the more interesting and important pages because you're going to use the word path for the rest of your life in computer science, especially once you get to an algorithms class. So that's that. And of course, we're not done. Let's talk a little bit more about terminology. And then I am mostly, uh, at least for a slide, I can let you have a breath of fresh air. So two vertices, we say, are connected if there's a path between them. So for example, A and D are not adjacent, but they are connected because you can go through H and from H to D. There's a way to get there. Okay, that's the idea. Actually, everybody in this little circle is connected to each other. It's like I can get from F all the way to I, I can get from A all the way to F. Like every, every pair of vertices in this little chunk is connected to each other, right? You pick out two of these guys, there's always a way to get from one to the other. I hope you can see that. And so that's connected. And we say that a set of vertices is connected if every pair of them is connected. So for example, this entire set is itself connected, we say. That's nice. So everybody here is connected. Also, everybody here is connected. There's always a way to pick out two, two vertices in this little group of them from C, E, and G. There's always a way to get from each one to the other, okay? So that's the idea. And we say that a graph itself, an entire graph is connected if all of its vertices, if this entire vertex set V is connected, or otherwise it's, we say it's disconnected, okay? So this entire graph, sadly, is not connected. Because this, pretend that this is the entire graph. There's no way to get from D to E. Those are not connected. So the graph itself is disconnected, but pieces of it are connected. Uh, disconnected. Pieces of it that are connected, like everybody here, everybody in this set is connected. So the set of vertices A, I, H, D, and F is connected, we say. Like you can say that an entire set is connected if there's a way to get from any pair, uh, the first one to the, to the next one. Pick out t any two of these, there's always a, get a way to get from one to the other like I to D or F to A, to A. They're all connected. All right, so that's a set of vertices connected. Likewise, the set C, E, G is connected. But the entire graph, sadly, disconnected. And then poor B, it's all by itself. Uh, we say, finally, that a connected component is a maximal set of vertices that is connected. So you could also have said, like, the set without the F. Those are all connected. All these four are connected to each other, but F, F is along for the ride too. Like it wants to play with the rest of those vertices. It's also connected to each of them. And so this set is like a maximal set of connected things and that's called a connected component, all right? It's a maximal set of, con of vertices that is connected and connected components partition a graph. So that's why we care about them. This is a connected component, just a bunch of vertices connected to each other. This is a connected component and then this is also a connected component, just B by itself. It's not connected to anything, but we still call it a connected component. Sadly, it is all alone. Okay, so with that in mind, I think I have a question for you just to get you practice with all these silly things. There's a lot of new terms for this section. Please go back and read over everything. But here's a graph. I would like you to, I believe, go back to this slide walk, close walk, circuit pack, path cycle. Look at that. And then try and answer all of these. Like what's the maximum length of a path in this graph? What's the maximum length of a cycle in this graph? Give an example of a closed walk that's not a circuit. Give an example of a circuit uh, of length zero in the graph. Interesting. All right, so let's talk about each of these, assuming you tried them. What's the maximum length of a path in the graph? And a path, remember, is a walk where there is no duplicated vertices or edges. So you can't reuse anything at all. All right, and I think if you, if you think about it long enough, it's like 
Since you cannot reuse any vertices, for example, the longest path has to be like among, like it, it visits every single vertex once. So here is that longest path. You have from here to here, here to here, here to here, B to A, A to D, D to F, F to I, I to C. It's visiting every vertex. You can't get any longer than that because otherwise you would have wrapped around to somebody else. So that is the answer for A. I hope you see that. What is the maximum length? Now B, what's the maximum length of a cycle in the graph? Give an example of a cycle of that length. And remember that a cycle is a circuit of length at least one, so it can't be empty, uh, in which no vertex except for the first and last occur more than once. So the first and last vertices must be the same. It's essentially a path where the first and last, though, it, though they link up at the end kind of. That's how I think of it at least. So let's find a cycle that does not, uh, that again, does not duplicate vertices. So I guess the maximum cycle would be one that visits everybody, uh, but does not come back around. I think we're kind of forced to never go to C because we'd have to like come back to I and that would duplicate vertices. So I believe that C cannot be in this cycle because of that. So otherwise you'd come back to I twice. And so with that in mind, the longest cycle would be the one that avoids C. It goes to everybody else. Could start at anywhere, like start, let's pretend it starts at A, for example, but it could have started at any of these and it just comes back around. See that? So that would be B. Uh, let's see here. And next, for C, give an example of a closed walk of length four that is not a circuit. All right, so what's the difference? A circuit is when there's no edge occurring more than once, but a closed walk can totally duplicate edges. Uh, it just has to, st to end in the same vertex. So let's talk about that closed walk that does not duplicate things. So for example, I don't know, let's go from A, B, E, and then let's also come back around though. Let's duplicate these edges. Back from E to B, back from B to A. So that would be my silly closed walk. That is not a circuit because it's duplicated edges. It's, it's reused the edges and you cannot do that with a circuit. Closed walk you can though, it's very generic. Okay, finally for D, give an example of a circuit of length zero in the graph. So a circuit of length zero. Well, if it has length zero, that means it goes nowhere. It must be a closed walk though. The, the first and last vertices must be the same. So if you just think about that long enough, it's just, well, pick somewhere and don't go anywhere. Oh wow, you, you came back to yourself. You just never left. And so that would be a circuit of length zero, for example. It would not, though, be a cycle, because a cycle must be a circuit of length at least once. So you must have made progress. You must have moved. But uh, apparently a circuit. You don't have to move at all. It's still a circuit. So that's, uh, that's the idea there. Hopefully that's making some sense to you. And then, yeah, we just have a few more things. There's a lot of new terms. I'm sorry. It's, it's graph theory. That is... Uh, those are the breaks, I guess. So, yeah, let's talk about Hamiltonian cycles and paths. So, this is all about you using everything, usually. So, a Hamiltonian cycle in an undirected graph is a cycle where you include every vertex in that graph. But, right, because it's a cycle, you do not duplicate vertices. You do not come back to a vertex ever. And so a Hamiltonian cycle is a way of like visiting every single one of these vertices without uh, revisiting any uh, without revisiting any vertex except for the first and last. Okay, so there's a way to do this. This is actually uh, I think we can find it. So it's just a way. There's plenty of ways actually, aren't there? You could have. Uh, you have to go to every vertex, but you cannot come back to a vertex except if it's the last one. So for example, like this, let's, like if you follow it in this direction, from here to here, here to here, here to here, uh, let's see, here to here, here to here, and here to here, that's, that's technically a Hamiltonian cycle. I have not duplicated any vertices, for example. There's multiple, aren't there? Like I could have done this one as well. Boop, boop, boop. 
uh, or sorry, I could have done it like this as well. Do, 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 do. There's that one. So I visited every vertex and I haven't wrapped back around at any of them. Uh, these are two different ways, two different Hamiltonian cycles in this graph. The cycle that includes every vertex uh, and a cycle though does not duplicate any vertices except for the first and last. All right, A Hamiltonian path is a path that includes every vertex, but it's not a cycle. So a very easy way to get a Hamiltonian path is just find a Hamiltonian cycle and then just chop off one of the edges, for example. So just like take this one, for example, and do not, do not close it off. So like go from here to here to here to here to here to here. Don't go all the way back to X. So that would be a Hamiltonian path. This is this is a Hamiltonian path HP, and these are Hamiltonian cycles HCs, I guess. See that? So that's uh, that's those Hamiltonian cycles and Hamiltonian paths. And then finally, we have an Euler circuit. That's probably the most fun one. An Euler circuit in a graph is a circuit that contains every vertex and every edge. So again, a circuit, you cannot duplicate edges. So it's just, there is a way somehow to visit every single edge in this graph and every single vertex without ever having to reuse an edge, which is kind of cool. And I chose this graph as an example because uh, actually, when I was in like elementary school, like first or second grade, there was this picture on the back of a milk carton and it was asking in like first grade terms if you could find an Euler circuit. Can you draw this thing without redoing, revisiting every place? Like I didn't, I just messed up, for example, there. But there is totally a way and if I think about it long enough, I'll probably find it. It's something like, dude, no, that would have caused me to reuse that one. Let's keep on trying. So do one of these will work. What about here? No, but I, I did it kind of upside down. It would have worked. Uh, one of these works, I promise. How about here to here? I think I tried this way already. So maybe what I should have done was go here. Nope. I promise that there's a way. I'll find it eventually. Um, I think I did it upside down was the problem. Here, 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 here. Nope. There is a way. Maybe start like this. Nope. I'm going to pause the video, figure it out, and then I'll show it to you because there is an Euler circuit to this graph. I promise. Okay, I think I figured it out. Here is a circuit that visits every, that contains every vertex and every edge. It's a way of going to all of them. So I think it's this one, then 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 this one. There. That's a way of visiting every edge, but never duplicating your work, never going to the same edge twice. Yay. So that is an Euler circuit uh, for this graph. Some graphs do not have Euler circuits because like, there's definitely uh, like a, an even oddness kind of thing going on there. You don't want to have too few or too many. So that's Euler circuits. And yeah, see if you can find a Hamiltonian cycle in this graph. Here's your example. And remember the Hamiltonian cycle is just a cycle that includes every vertex. Doesn't have to include every edge though. So one solution, assuming you looked into it, was would have been something like this. Go from here to 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 here. So that is a Hamiltonian cycle. Wee, that one it visits every vertex and it is a cycle. Okay. Doesn't have to visit every edge. Maybe there is no Euler circuit in this graph. I'm not sure. You can figure it out. Exercise for you. All right. Finally, my last example for us is called traveling salesperson. It's also sometimes called traveling salesman because I don't know, somebody made it up in the, in the days where there were only traveling salesmen or something. But nowadays we call it traveling salesperson. And uh, here's the problem. Given a, essentially a graph, but it, it kind of looks like a map. Given a list of cities and the distances between each pair of cities, what is the shortest possible route that visits each city exactly once and returns to that original city? 
So it is uh, an interesting problem. It's how do you get to, how do you like starting here, because that's where you live, how do you move around in this graph of cities and distances and move around the quickest without having to travel as much as possible? You can, you can imagine like following some routes is, uh, would be very bad, like going from here to here to here all the way back here. I think that's worse than following this 10 miles from one to two edge. Okay, that's the idea. So you have, you can model this idea as a map, but all that you really need is a graph. Just saying like, all right, if I went here to here, what was the distance? Rather than if I went here to here, what, what would have that distance been, have been? And you wanna make a cycle that visits every single place that you care about, because you're a salesperson trying to sell your stuff, and you wanna end up back home, but you want to, I guess, save as much as possible on gas. All right, so you can model this with a weighted graph and you just try every permutation, like, all right, I'll go to two first and then four, then three, or I'll go to three first, then four, then two, every single possibility, you can try them all. There's n factorial of them, if there are n separate cities to go through. And that actually proves that the traveling salesperson problem is a very hard problem. Uh, n factorial is a very horrible, it's essentially exponential time uh, in algorithm. And all of our best algorithms f to solve the traveling salesperson problem is at worst exponential. We can't make it any better. And if p is equal to np, then maybe there's hope, but otherwise it's a very hard problem to solve. You just have to like, all right, let's try going from Sacramento to Olympia, try going from uh, Sacramento to whatever the capital of Idaho is, is it Boise? Just try all the possibilities of all the capitals of all the 50 states, for example. And this is apparently the solution, saying that you start in Sacramento or something. This is the best route for you to visit every single state capital. Like it's, it's best to go in this order. Okay. So that is the traveling salesperson problem. It's a very hard problem to solve, and it can be modeled very simply with graphs and weights, so a weighted graph. You just try all the possibilities and eventually you'll find it. So that is the traveling salesperson problem in a nutshell. And that is where I want to stop today. So uh, remember that you have a test this week, so good luck on your test. We'll come back and talk about some algorithms some ways to move around graphs that we've represented inside of our computer, either as like an adjacency list or an adjacency matrix. There are some very famous algorithms that we need to talk about. So we'll do that next time, and I will see you then.